John chapter 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. In other words, he said, You have not lied. You've told me the truth. So he told her to go call her husband. Uh, A lot of people, you know, would try to make excuses or skirt the truth. But she said, I don't have a husband. And then he says in verse 18, For thou hast had, if you circle in your Bible, circle the word had. It's uh, in the past tense. And uh, the word implies that this woman has been married five different times. And that in each of her marriages, evidently, like we have discussed in Deuteronomy 24, the Magna Carta of divorce, that she was given a bill of divorcement and sent out of his house, and there was some uncleanness in her. Now remember... In Deuteronomy 24, there is no mention of adultery because if you commit adultery, you're put to death. So Jesus says to the woman, Thou hast had five husbands. Now notice there that he never mentions that she's living in adultery or that somehow her life is impure. In fact, I believe uh, that Jesus stays at the home of this woman for a couple days, uh, like uh, many of the commentaries say, that Jesus had to stay somewhere, and that uh, he stayed a couple days in this woman's home, and there was nothing unclean or impure about him staying there. Now, he says to her, He whom thou now hast is not thy husband. So she's living with a man. Uh, There has been no legal ceremony where they have been declared husband and wife. I had a young man call me, actually texted me a couple weeks ago. And uh, he had met a young lady that he, he loved, he thought, and, and wanted them to be together, but he didn't believe in marriage. And she told him, she said, I'm not going to start a relationship with you if, if you're not going to marry me. Uh, because he told her up front, he said, now, I'm, I don't believe in marriage and all that. And so she just told him, I don't want nothing to do with you. Well, he got upset, and he was 
calling around and, and he was talk, calling me because I know the young lady and he was wanting me to put in a good word for him. And, and I said, look, if you don't believe in marriage, I'm not putting in a good word for you. Because marriage was instituted by God in the beginning. God took from the side of Adam uh, the rib and he uh, made a helpmate for Adam and she became his wife. God joined them together as husband and wife. And all through the Old Testament and throughout history, marriage in almost every culture that existed was a part of their normal life. When you took a mate to be your partner, you married them, you made a commitment to them that you were going to be faithful to them and love them until death do you part. So <clears throat> I gave him some Bible verses and uh, tried to help him out. I hope that he's come to understand that. So Jesus said, you've had five husbands and the one that you're with, you're not married to. In that sayest thou truly. So they were living together. You say, what do you think about that? Uh, I don't think highly of it. Living together is, uh, I mean, children don't have security. Uh, parents need to be committed, and they need to be committed for life. And this shacking up stuff and living together uh, has done more harm and damage uh, to young people's lives. You know, it's like if, if you watch anything on regular TV, uh, they just make out fornication and adultery like it's nothing. You know, somebody acting, you know, talks about their relationship, they're going out on their mate, and they think it means nothing. But it's sin against God. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. So I want us to stop there and uh, give some consideration uh, to what goes on. You know, uh, probably over 40 years ago, as I read through the Bible, I remember reading this. And when I would read it, it would cause me to, to stop and think about this because I thought now, you know, something just don't add up here. If this woman had been married before, uh, not even to think about five times, but if she'd been married even once, and now she was shacking up with a man, you would think that Jesus would tell her that she was living in adultery. But she's not. And for those of you who were here Wednesday night, we talked about the husband of one wife, and, uh, and then before I got sick, we've been talking about uh, how that uh, this common idea that whenever a person gets divorced uh, that w if they don't have biblical grounds or even if they do uh, many believe that there is no grounds for divorce some believe that you can divorce a person I believe the Bible verifies that for adultery and fornication or desertion or death those are clearly defined. But nowhere does the Bible indicate that even if a person is in a bad situation where they have uh, uh, disobeyed God, are they living in adultery in a perpetual state of sin because of, adultery, because of a divorce? Uh, divorce is sin like any other sin. And when we repent and ask God's forgiveness... He forgives us. Amen. And if I didn't believe that, uh, I would have a whole lot of problems with what some people say about marriage and divorce. Here we have an example of the mess that people get themselves into because of the pursuit of sin. It parallels the sins of our culture today. I mean, uh, I heard them talking the other day, the average 
uh, American that's over 40 has been divorced three times. And uh, some of them have been divorced many, many, many times. And we see this in our society where you'll have maybe four or five children from different relationships. And uh, it seems like things have really gotten into a, a terrible situation. I don't relate all the things that the Bible says about the Samaritan woman who Jesus met at Jacob's well. But I want to examine the focus of our subject so that we can understand the truth and the magnitude of what Jesus said to her. Notice that when he requested uh, about her husband, he said, go call thy husband. Now, Jesus was omnipotent and omniscient. He knew all things. He knew that she was not married. But he asked her, go call your husband. And come hither, let me, let me meet him, bring him to me. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you've answered well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that sayest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. I mean, can you imagine from her perspective, you go out to draw water at the well, you meet this man, and as some have stated, she went in a time uh, when most of the other women would not go because she had had five husbands. And no doubt she had been perhaps mocked, ridiculed, uh, and that's subjection, uh, supposition. We don't know if that's the case or not. But anyway, uh, she must have been quite surprised that someone just looks and says, you've already had five husbands, and the one you're with now, you're not married to. And so I can understand why she says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Because no one would have known uh, these things unless they were given special knowledge of God. Uh, now those who that hold to the position that for this to be true, then all of the previous five husbands must be dead. Is this true? We cannot prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. However, it's very unlikely and against reason that this claim is true. Now, there are many who believe that all five of her husbands were dead. And that's why uh, Jesus said, you've had five husbands. If this be the case, bringing up of the five previous husbands is to reveal her wicked and sinful past so that she will see that she is a violator of the law of God. The Lord Jesus wants her to realize that she needs God in her life. And He's revealing to her that she's a sinner, that she has been married five times and you know, there's a lot of conjecture about why she would have been married so many times. Uh, some say that she could have had some illness uh, where she couldn't work or do the things that other women could do, or, or there could have been uh, some sort of problem she had that made the other husbands not want to stay with her. But whatever the situ situation was, uh, we would think in, that, in this day that this is especially unusual to have five husbands and all of them be dead. And now the one she's with that's living is uh, 
still alive and she's not married to him. I want you to hold your place there and turn back with me to uh, Deuteronomy 24 for just a moment. I want to uh, make a couple points about uh, this passage. Whatever sin she's been guilty of, Indeed, we see that she had sinned. If it had to fall within the category of uncleanness as given in Deuteronomy 24. Now remember, and I, excuse me, I say this because in my mind, whenever I read that, it just immediately pops into my mind, well, she must have committed adultery. But no, if she had committed adultery, remember she had been put to death. So here in Deuteronomy 24, it says in verse 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. Now that's the Magna Carta of, of divorce. This is Moses. We know in the beginning, Jesus said it was not so, but because of the hardness of your heart, God gave you the, the writings of divorcement, so that people who were having problems and could not get along, they would have some kind of recourse where the woman would be treated with honor and integrity. And when she went out of his house, verse 2, when she's departed, she may go and be another man's wife. And that's what it says. Uh, <clears throat> her husband don't want her. You know, her life could be uh, really drastically affected by this. Women were uh, affected much more than men because normally the man would own the home and, and he would uh, own the land. And a lot of times women were treated like they were a piece of property. It wasn't, wasn't good. It was wrong. It was sinful. And uh, he says, If the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement. Notice, notice now that, that word hate comes in. So he's, he's found something unclean in her, but it, it has to be something more than just a little thing because now it says that uh, if that husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house... Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she's defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance." You remember in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when Ezra came to uh, take the land and purify it, <clears throat> that the men who were married to women who were idolaters, were they had to divorce and then marry a woman who was a godly woman who believed in Jehovah God. And uh, so now this writing of divorcement is made clear and uh, the woman can go out. She's got a writing of divorcement and so she legally can be another man's wife. She's not unclean. She's not defiled. And the Lord said, you do this and if you don't, you'll cause the land to sin. Now we don't, we don't normally think about things like that, but our actions, our sins, the things that we do affect even our country. It affects each other. 
It affects our family. And so he says, this is what you're to do. When Jesus told her to go get her husband, we find that this woman has had five and now lives with a man who is not her husband. Many commentators uh, reached the conclusion that this woman was an immoral woman who had been divorced five times. Yet John 4 never says she was divorced. There are at least two other possible reasons why this woman has had five husbands. One possibly is that she was unable to have children. The biblical language uh, is that she may have been barren. In Genesis 11.30, we read about uh, uh, what happens when a woman was barren. Uh, Many times, uh, husbands in that culture, they placed great importance on having children and especially on having sons who would carry their name. So if if the woman was barren and couldn't have children, it's very obvious that uh, he had solid grounds for divorce, according to Deuteronomy 24. So it was possible that the men that had married her had found out that she couldn't have children, so they divorced her to marry a more fertile woman who could give them a daughter or especially a son. She could also have been trapped by the Leviticus marriage law. Her five husbands could have been brothers for whom she was supposed to produce an heir. Remember, uh, according to Leviticus, if a man uh, had had a wife and he had a brother and he was killed and had no son to carry on his name, then his wife was to marry him so that they could have a son to carry on the name. Now, we know that that would certainly be a very uh, difficult situation to be in, but that did happen. And uh, if you look at Matthew 22, uh, we see a, a, a reference to that. Matthew 22, I'll read it, verse number uh, 24. The Bible says, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die... Having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second, the third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. So here she was, and she had been through seven husbands. And uh, in every case, uh, she had been bound by the law, the Levitical law of producing an heir, and she couldn't do it. Therefore, in the resurrections, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So we see that the point is that regardless of the reason of her obvious multiple divorces, this text plainly declares that she... For thou hast had five husbands, so are the words of Jesus, and they are authoritative. Jesus said, you have well said that you have had five husbands. Meaning that this was over and done. That she had for whatever reason, and we don't know, only God knows why it all happened. But here we see that Jesus 
is in complete agreement with math with Deuteronomy 24 1 through 4 he doesn't tell her that she's living in adultery he doesn't tell her that uh, you know her whole life is under the curse of sin because of her divorce he's very loving very kind and very patient the conclusion is this if Jesus said that she had had past tense five husbands then Jesus recognized the dissolution of marriage by divorce we've examined uh, many different translations from conservative to a little bit liberal and all of them agree concerning the tense it's in the past and we see in the Greek presented by Robertson's word pictures and of all the Greek scholars that I've read after and studied after A.T. Robertson is, is in my opinion the best uh, his word pictures have been uh, studied by most every pastor and gain great wisdom from them. Uh, A.T. Robertson says, Thou hast had five husbands. The Greek is Pentagar Andrus Eskis, for thou didst have five men. And its second aorist, uh, constitutive, active, indicative of echo. Jesus substantiates this fully when he himself says, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. In other words, you have, you have told the truth. You now have no husband. And the only conclusion we can draw logically and reasonably from the text is that Jesus believed and understood biblical divorce and the grounds upon which it could be granted. He understood that this woman had been divorced multiple times and he accepted the obvious that she was no longer married to all five or any one of them. I talked to a man last week and he's been through a number of divorces. And I asked him, I said, uh, well, just tell me a little bit about your life and how it happened. And he said, well, I was brought up in a Christian home. And he said, I never wanted a divorce. He said, I wanted to get married and have a family and honor God. And he told the story about how he and his wife were together and uh, he suspected she was cheating on him. And uh, he finally caught her with this man and uh, she was committing adultery and he was willing to forgive her but she left him for this other man so he said I didn't, I didn't want it he said it, it broke my heart he said I, I would have done anything to restore my marriage but she didn't want me he went on to tell me about the other situation he had. and Each one was more complicated. But he said, here's the bottom line. He said, in every divorce I went through, I did not want any of them. And I didn't mean for this to happen, and I didn't want it to happen. But he said, the reality of it is, it did. And, and the thing is, we can't control people's lives and their minds we may meet someone and think wow this is a tremendous individual we may have a lot in common uh, we may have convictions the same and all of that and we think this is the person for me and we get married and years pass and problems develop and one or the other person for whatever reason decides I don't want to be with you 
Now, I've been through this with people. Uh, been through it with some very close individuals, people in my family. And uh, I've had to deal with it in ways that I, I thank God for because it gave me empathy and made me try to understand what the Bible was really saying. Now, I could have taken the normal stance and I'd have had no problems. I'd have been accepted by all the brethren and uh, all of that. But I'm, as I've told you, that's not my goal. I don't care what the brethren think. Uh, as long as I'm doing what God wants me to do and preaching the truth of the Bible, that's all I care about, is, is preaching what God has said in love and in faithfulness. But the Bible is very clear that uh, divorce is something that occurs and many people don't want it. Uh, Brother Richard Adams, <clears throat> uh, some of you know Brother Richard Adams. He was a, uh, in a motorcycle gang. He was like the head man in the gang. Had hair way down on his back and uh, wore a big bandana and he was a wicked man. I remember meeting him when I was a young teenager and seeing his motorcycle gang. And buddy, I mean, uh, he was a bad hoss. Well, Brother Richard Adams got saved. And the Lord changed his life. Now, he had been married before he was saved to a woman and she loved the motorcycle life and loved the wickedness. And when he got saved, he started going to church, serving God. He got rid of his Harley, and he cut his hair. He started dressing different. His whole life changed, and guess what happened? She said, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And she left him. Now, he didn't want the divorce, but his wife left him became unfaithful with other men. And many people condemned Brother Richard Adams because a divorce had occurred before he was even saved. How is it that we can make divorce more wicked than any other sin in all the Bible and we can say, well, God can forgive us of all these other things, but when it comes to divorce... God can't forgive. Is there something wrong with that? Or am I just Seems so. on Mars? Seems so. And God has forgiven us of all of our sins. And whether it's in your past, I mean, if it's in your past and, and, and you're... You get a divorce, you don't want the divorce, you have grounds, your mate leaves you, deserts you, and then, then the Lord has, has saved you after that, how can someone hold that person accountable for that? I remember when I came to uh, register at Lexington Baptist College, uh, one of the first questions people asked me was, have you been divorced? And I said, no, only by the grace of God. Because, you know, I was as close as you could get uh, to getting married, but I didn't want to get married. Just because of the pressure, you know, that she kept putting on me. Well, I want you to marry me. And I, and I, I just didn't love her that way and, and uh, didn't want to marry her. And the Lord delivered me from that. I broke up with her and I told her, I said... Uh, if you start going to church and the Lord saves you and your life changes, then maybe we can have a relationship. But if it doesn't, there's no way, I said, because we're never going to get along. And uh, I, I gave her some months to see if, if anything was real, and it wasn't. So I told her, I said, I'm sorry, goodbye. I'm going, to, I'm going to follow the Lord. 
Now, that was only God's grace. I could have been married and then been divorced a month later or whatever. But God spared me. But let me tell you something. I was a sinner. And I committed sins. And God forgave me of all my sins. And when I hear people talk about people who have been divorced and hold them as second class citizens or half saint and half sinner and they put them down and say they can't be forgiven I tell you it breaks my heart I wish that we could all study the Bible carefully and not be so hard and harsh upon people who are broken because people need encouragement from the text, Jesus understood biblical divorce. This woman had been divorced multiple times, and he accepted that she was no longer married to any of the five men that she was married to. It's obvious that each husband had obeyed the law of Moses and given her a bill of divorcement as required by the marriage union. And in this case, as in all the others, we have seen that they all are in perfect harmony with the original revelation on divorce as given by Moses in Deuteronomy 24. Now where did that law come from? That law of Deuteronomy 24 came from God. God gave it to Moses. And Moses gave it to the people. I raised this question with a pastor a couple weeks ago. And I asked him, I said, have you ever read Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4? And he said, yeah, I think I have. And I said, ask him two or three questions. And it was obvious he had never really read it. And this brother is a pastor of a pretty good sized church. And... Uh, it's obvious he hadn't even read Deuteronomy 20 or studied it. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, there was many times I've read Deuteronomy 24, but it never, I never really took the time to understand uh, what it was really saying. And I thank God that His Word is there and that we can examine it and find perfect harmony with the Word. Jesus was in harmony with Deuteronomy 24, and in all those cases that we've studied, we've seen that divorce does indeed sever the marriage relationship completely. And she had had five husbands. Now the Lord didn't commend her for it. He didn't say that you've done a good thing. Uh, nor does he condemn her because none of us really know what her situation was. You know, it, I could tell you some of the uh, situations that I've been involved in before and women have told me things that their husband was doing to them. I couldn't imagine being treated that way. I mean, if, if we really knew and understood what many uh, of these situations are, women are living almost like being captive and mistreated and, and never shown love and compassion. And the Bible teaches us that a man is to love his wife as himself. And as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If you don't love your wife, you don't care for her and treat her with kindness, uh, she gets beat down. You know, she goes through heartaches and troubles. And she needs her husband to hold her and tell her he loves her and be good to her, be kind to her, be understanding. Because 
us men, we really don't know what our wives go through. And uh, showing them love and respect is the least we can do. If you want to have a happy marriage, a happy life together, always treat your wife with love and respect. Never hit her. Never abuse her. Because God's watching. The Bible says that if we cause our wife to be hurt, God will not answer our prayers. James talks about you know, causing hurt to our mate and our prayers are hindered because of that. Let's stand together. Brother, would you come to lead us?